Hello, and welcome back to Stephen and Adam's Hack Attack. Welcome, hackers. Yeah. So, we just talked a whole bunch about, um, what, backgrounds? Yeah. And, backgrounds and, and inspiration, yeah. And we opened a couple interesting cans of worms. Like, it seems like backgrounds maybe feel very naturally tied into the progression of time, whether it's, like, how you get the background and, like, whether you're young or old when you get it. And then also the passing of time as far as um, downtime is concerned. Uh, there are parts of backgrounds that are tied to like assumptions about the world in languages and uh, in the skill proficiencies you get. There are parts of the background that are tied to things like the economy of the game and how the adventurer affects uh, historical medieval economy. Um, and then uh, there are ways that changing the features of backgrounds affect... Um, the way other players are able or not able to interact with the game world because suddenly people with the background have something very specific they can do so it kind of implies that other people can't do that i think yeah. it's super i think it's super interesting about dungeons and dragons like specifically as a game that um in the dungeon master's guide in advanced dungeons and dragons which is generally considered to be the forefather uh, of what modern D&D &D is, uh, the Dungeon Master Guide specifically straight up says, and this is like, it's a paraphrase, but the quote uses many of these words. It says, um, you cannot have a meaningful campaign without tracking time. Yeah. Yeah. Like it just flat out, Gary fucking Gygax yep. is like, if you are not tracking days and weeks and shit in game, you are failing Man, and you are playing D&D wrong. Gary Gygax had like 10 minute chunks that broke down into like you know, one hour chunks that broke into four yeah. hour watches that like the watch system comes straight out of the AD and D second yeah, edition. Mother, mother, motherfucker was serious that. about that shit. Mm hmm. Yeah. That's great. So this is the thing. And it just seems to have fallen by the wayside because people think it's boring. Um, yeah. But um, I don't know. I track I track time in my game. Swan Song. I know exactly what day it is all the time yep. because it's important. Um, it, it matters a lot for the West Marches, and I think it creates a much more interesting world in the West Marches as a result. I mean, like yep. I I need to ask characters to start planning their birthdays because it's been like four or five months since the start yeah. of the West Marches. Yeah, yeah. I keep I keep meaning to do that in Swan Song to figure out what his birthday is, yeah. so that we can have a scene when it's like someone's birthday. Sicarian's birthday. Oh my god, I want to go to Mr. Sakari's birthday yeah, party absolutely. so <laughs> Wu comes out with a cake. Oh my god. And he gets shot. It's... Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. So, yeah, so we talked about background. We talked about all the stuff that spins out of that, like um, background as a representation of the time spent before being an adventurer, off screen time, the idea of how that might tie into what you do off screen otherwise, et cetera, et cetera. So, this is this is how hacking works, and this is why this thing that was like just going to be a one-off turned into a ongoing series because it's like every time you look under a rock, there's several more buried subsystems yep. you need to dig out and and mess with uh, yep. to make that rock sit properly and, where you want it. And every time we have an episode of the hack attack, we identify like five new things we need to hack. Yeah, yeah, basically. Okay. I sometimes feel like game design is a bit like. Um, uh, like creating a like a Buddhist mandala where you just like spend oh, yeah. hours doing all these like tiny intricate things, and as soon as you're done, you're like, okay, well, whatever, never, never mind, forget it. <laughs> yeah, we're done. <laughs> um, but I mean, that's the point, right? The the fun is in the uh, in the the experience. Speaking of which, yeah, let's hear about <laughs> this, Adam. So like, I went away and I talked. I thought a little bit about backgrounds. Adam went away and he thought a little bit about experience. So I'm gonna let him present. And maybe I'll see how many Socratic questions I can come up with for this. Yeah, let's let's dig into this thing. So, um, okay, so the variant of experience, the, the goal behind creating this variant subsystem is to reward players for a different behavior. Uh, we want to reward them for behavior that we want to encourage, right, which is like exploration. We can talk about that. Um, so, A, the reward players for the things we want them to do. B, things that the game provide challenges to. So you don't want to reward experience in basic, like regular old D&D, if we're just playing it as it is, and we were like, let's cut experience completely, and we're going to replace it with a system that gives you experience every time you use the word longsword. Uh, <laughs> you get 10 experience every time you say longsword. All right, what's your equipment? I have 26 longswords. No, no, no. Um, I have one longsword and one longsword. And long one longsword and, and yeah. one longsword. <laughs> exactly. So we want... 
we want to give them a situation in which uh, I mean DD does this already. It gives XP for and it provides challenges for combat, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a thing. Um, but we want to give we have different challenges that we want to reward. Yep. And then third, we want to reward players for behavior that fits the creative direction of West Marches. So this is uh, rewarding genre play. Uh, this is rewarding um, behaving like a participant in the West Marches universe, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we don't want to give XP for playing characters that don't engage with the setting. We don't want to give experience for doing things that are outside of the setting, right? Because the point there is to um, uh, is to encourage uh, things. So those are my three goals for designing a variant experience system. Now, what I would reward experience for in the West Marches, uh, there's, there's four things. Mm -hmm. um, exploration of the greater environment. So wandering around the map finding stuff, uh, exploration of specific locations. So secondary to the greater environment, things within the environment. So world, hex, dungeon, room, object or monster. Right? That's the, that's mm. the, the upside down pyramid. Um, so interaction with NPCs or monsters. Uh, and this isn't just they exist, but like learning things about them, engaging them in some mechanical way. Right, D and D does this. D and D's interaction with monsters is fight them, or get around them, or avoid them, or whatever. Um, and then the last one is investment in the town. Um, so we want to reward uh, experience for investing in town. And that that one's actually the simplest, but I'll leave it for the last because it's it's not as tied to my my idea for varying XP. So to go into a little bit more detail, um, exploration of the greater environment means uh, rewards for adding items to the map for future reference. Um, right now, like in the settings that I played, um, I don't remember caring much about the map. There was a map, but I didn't really look at it because I assumed it was not well kept. Yes. Um, and I think it was just you, were just you were just adding stuff to the map. Like, I don't know if the players were doing that. It just mm -hmm. wasn't important, right? I, I had to try to guess. Honestly, at one point, you were like, okay, you go six days this way, and then you think you've curved this way. And I'm like, dude, I don't need to know where I am because I don't care. Like, yeah. I'm lost. What's right in front of me? So we don't want that, right? We mm -hmm. want... We want to be able to reward people for engaging with the map, by which I meant like adding things and passing information along, because that's what the map is, right? It's a record of the space. Yes. Um, though, I mean, we can get all Baudrillard about it and say that the map is the space, and it's very true of Dungeons and Dragons, but we'll we'll save the philosophy for later. Um, we want to reward the passing along of information to the other players. Um, I often feel like I don't have the time. Uh, to watch every episode of West Marches as much as I would love to. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tune in and watch it, so I do feel underprepared when I join a session and I'm playing with people who have more experience. Like, JP knows everything that happens in every episode, and so yeah. I, I feel like I'm pretty far back on that in that regard. So I'm like, okay, well, let's go to the Barons. And JP's like, fuck that, I'm making a new character. And I'm like, what? <laughs> really? Like... Are the Barons that bad? Like, you can't even risk your dude for that? Um, so, uh, preventing that. Rewarding players for passing along information to the to their players. And there's some... The, the, the fans are doing some of this already. Like, there's the wiki and stuff. Yeah. But I would love it to be in character, right? Um, to say, like, we're sitting around and we're talking about what happened last time. Or we're talking about the last time we were in the marches. Or, like, some, play, some other characters telling me these things. Yeah, um, I mean, that could easily be some sort of, like, before you set out town scene where it's like, okay, you four are, are together, but some of you have been out there before. Does any every, of you want to, like, update people on what happened? Every uh, uh, Torchbearer and Mousegard both do this in that they say um, somebody recaps the last episode, and then they can't recap the next one. So they have mm -hmm. to, like, someone, you have to pass it around. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a thing. So I want to reward the passing along of information. And I want to re reward discovering new locations for the first time. I think this belongs in the exploration of the greater environment because it's like, hey, I thought this hex was empty. There's a castle over there. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. Or like, oh, I heard a rumor that there was some ruins here. There they are. Put yeah. it on the map. We discovered it. This is the World of Warcraft model, right, where we clear the, we clear the fog, and yeah. there it is. I have a question for you. Would you both reward players for discovering something new the first time and for adding that item to the map for future reference? Yeah, totally. Because yeah. adding it to the map is something one person does, mm -hmm. and discovering it is a thing a group, the group does. Uh, do you, are you envisioning experience points as being given directly to individuals or accrued for the group? 
both. Uh, I think that the the way D and D does it, I mean, we tr- we can treat it like all of this stuff can be treated in the same way that um, encountering experiences, where it's like participants in the encounter are rewarded a share of experience. Mm-hmm. Um, again, you could say like, okay, who's going to be the mapper for this session? Yeah, you do the map, you get the XP, but you also have to pay attention to the map and do the work. Right, you're being rewarded for doing the work. Hmm. Um, and that's the thing, right? You could volunteer for it. And if two people want to do it, then decide as players, right? Be like, well, I'm a level ahead of you. And if you want to map, dude, let's get you caught up. You're the mapper. Mm. Do it right. Um, so so that's the thing. Um, and then, yeah, rewarding, discovering it, I think, is just following up. It leads to the next piece. And I think it's just following up on rumors, uh, making those, like, wandering around in the wilderness checks, and eventually getting to the adventure location for today to be like, hey, here it is. Yep, definitely. Yeah, so those are those are ways that we would explore the greater environment um, and getting uh, XP uh, for that. Um, now, from there, it kind of gets more complicated the way that I envision it for the very end in that exploration of specific locations and exploration of interaction with NPC and monsters work kind of the same way. Mm-hmm. That each location could have like a secrets book that contains some amount of hidden things nested in order of difficulty, right? So the first thing that you unlock is here. it exists. We know where it is, it exists. And that's part of the exploration of greater environment. So each location starts with the first thing checked. As a GM, you keep this list secret and you're like, okay, they know where this castle is. Check the box, that one's done. Mm-hmm. The next thing should be more difficult and the subsequent thing should be more difficult thereafter. Um, discovery of each specific thing on the list is awarded experience in the same way monster combat would be rewarded in stock D&D. There's a pool of experience split among everyone who participated in unearthing that discovery. Mm-hmm. And then this is where we can tie in special bonuses when certain milestones are reached. So these could be when you discover the abandoned chapel of you know whatever god, you get a blessing from that god, right? Like, good job, you uncovered this temple and, and exposed it to the world again. Everybody gets... Uh, experience and maybe you get a plus one to your next death save. You get advantage on your death save for the rest of the episode. Hmm. Right. So these can be mechanical. They can also be like just character stuff, right? Like you are marked as a you know a benefactor of this god's power. So the next time that you whenever you encounter other members of that god, they treat you as though you're an acolyte. Mm-hmm. Right? So these are milestones that pop up. Um, they could also be advantages to defeating uh, obstacles or monsters, right? Where it's like, oh, because you figured this thing out, the next thing you get into, you don't have to fight it. Here's an easy way to avoid that problem. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I put together an example. I'm not going to read all the things, but like I made up this one that was like the Keep of the Winter Warlock. So the first thing is the Keep resides in Hex 101, right? It's, this is the Hex where it is. This is where we found it. Uh, two, you find a way in, right? The outer wall can be breached by a hidden gate. Uh, three is historical, like the keep was built by enslaved goblins. And they, they all just get more and more difficult um, as you go along because you're discovering things that are harder to find. And you'll notice if you look at it, and everybody can look at the document, as you get closer to the end, the assumption is that you're going to encounter the warlock himself. Mm-hmm. And maybe some of these secrets are, well, we don't have to fight the warlock. We can defeat the warlock by sacrificing true love, and that'll kill him, right? And it'll revive his beloved, and he'll be banished. So this is where, and I, I was thinking really hard about how, you notice how in fairy tales, it's never like, I mean, it's not like Beowulf, right? It's not like, and then Beowulf went to Grendel's lair and punched the living shit out of him. And got him in a headlock and just punched him in the eye until he was dead. And then he killed his mom. And then he killed yeah. everyone else he knew, right? We don't want Beowulf. So we want, uh, you learn that the witch has uh, an, an affection for the flesh of children. So you bring along a kid to lure them in and then you push them in an oven because you know that only burning kills the witch because you learned that by going to this place and learning these things. You engage with these locations to learn about a challenge that was ahead of you. Yeah, 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 definitely. So I think that this ties into the fairy tale thing because it's always about finding the tool for the job, and the tool is often um, secret, right? It's often like mm-hmm. it's the Achilles heel, right? It's like, okay, yeah. cool, no one can beat Achilles. He's super badass. But if you're the guy that finds out that he was, you know, dipped by his heel, and you go after that, then fucking that's how you beat him, right? It's not that you're tougher than him. You just know a thing that. Nobody else does. That's actually, I mean, that's really in keeping with fairy tales. Because really, yeah. like, um, like people who get into fairy tale situations that are troublesome, they don't necessarily die, right? It's often like 
they have to spend a lot of time doing something they really don't like, where they're like they're serving Baba Yaga for you know six months in her hut, and then like they they meet a talking bird who says, "Hey, by the way, next time Baba Yaga leaves, you know, take the lentils from her pot and throw them in the fire, and they turn into goblins that like do all the work for you." I mean, it's in it's in every folklore ever, right? Mm-hmm. Like. Vampires will fuck your shit, but if you get a handful of rice grains and throw them on the ground, they're just gonna count them, and then yep. you can hack their head off, yep. right? But you gotta know about the rice thing, you gotta know about beheading kills vampires, and it allows you as the GM to customize, and this this is the next thing. So monsters and NPCs have their own list of secrets and knowledge that can be unlocked for experience rewards, mm-hmm. and this can be unlocked either through conversation with them. So, you know, uh, you could say the mayor of Veriscali uh, has a fondness for a particular kind of liquor and will do, uh, will grant a favor to anyone who brings them this liquor, mm. right? So that gives you an advantage fictionally, and it tells you, cool, this is the thing we know about him in the world, and let's go and, and get that liquor and come back so we can get the mayor to do this thing for us so we can engage more easily in the next thing that we're doing. And I know that you do a lot of customizing of D&D monsters as they stand, mm-hmm. right? Because, like... You don't want a game where you're like, you see some goblins, and everyone's like, cool, goblins have one hit dice, blah de blah blah I'm not scared of goblins, fuck it, yeah. right? I, I'm, I'm a level four character. Goblins don't matter to me. Let's go fight them for XP. Um, so you can customize monsters to say, like, and, and again, they work on a list status. So it's like, you have a stat block where it's like, this is, if you fight them, these are the stats for those things. But what's more important is that, and this is something that, um, and I've been thinking about it for a little while, but I noticed that um, Pillars of Eternity already does this. We're writing the monster manual for ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. Where we're saying, okay, goblins exist. H- half wolves exist, right? I didn't know that until that session. I should be rewarded for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, for, you know, even if it's a random encounter, you're the one who encountered them. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. You know, and then also learn more things. Like, goblins exist. Uh, goblins are human children stolen at birth. They live exclusively in the barren swamp. The goblin queen is the only one who has the magic to make more goblins. Goblins will die if you touch them with fresh human milk. Like these things, and again, it's it's just that that fairy tale thing, right? Where every monster is unique and interesting. I like I like where you're going with that, Adam. Yeah, and like I'm not look. I can fight all the goblins in the world if I want to, but like if I carry around a jar of of human milk and we encounter goblins and I just throw it in their face, that's a fight I don't have to have. Right? They're now, all dead. I find there's something very interesting here that implies something else down. or yeah. um, it, it implies something else about the game. It implies that um, fighting is not nearly as big a focus, which we sort of knew originally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, also, yeah. It, it may imply that hit points aren't nearly as important. Seriously, and, uh, yeah, bypass that shit. And that it, it might be possible to, for example, have characters that level up who don't gain hit points, but who are nevertheless much more powerful than their comrades. Yeah, and I, I think like this goes back to classic D and D in that if you get in a fight with some monsters, you have fucked up. Like you, that, well, you're a bad adventurer. You should have avoided it or cheated. Yeah. Right. And again, like let's let's go back to the Beowulf example, like. I'm sure that if if Beowulf was less a less a, a martial epic and more a fairy tale, Beowulf would not have he would have fought the, the monster the first time and probably gotten beat up and mm-hmm. then gone and found a way to cheat. Right? He would have been like, well, if Brendel is exposed to sunlight, he will die. So let's go find him at night and uh, tie him up. And when the sun comes up, we'll drag him out and he'll just disintegrate. Psh, problem yep. solved. Yep. Yep. But he would only know that by you only know that as a PC by engaging with the. Um, the the mechanism right hitting those points and interacting with monsters and NPCs and you as a player can do that actively right I can I can seek out a goblin expert right I can find the superstitious midwife and I can learn that goblins are made from human children yep um, you know and it's I, I think that it's a way to reward exploration of the setting both in the large scale on the map small scale on the place and again, again thinking about that pyramid right you have world hex location room object Mm -hmm. and if you wanted to you can you can apply this model to npcs to monsters to magic items right you could say okay cool um you know captain coke you have a magic saber uh you cannot use any of its magic power until you discover three of its secrets 
Yep, yep. Go to town. Well, and then uh, Captain, Ca- like, Captain Coke is like, awesome, I have this sword. It's made out of, like, insanely heavy meteoric iron or something. I can't use it. It's not doing me any good. But now I'm going to go seek out the man who made it. Or I'm going to seek out the last bearer. And we're going to figure out how to use this. And then after a session or two, cool, now it's the, like, awesome sword. And I've built this bond with it. And it matters in the in the universe. Well, it, it could, I mean, like, very easily tie into the... the the tooth of grief that Galahan got. It's like, okay, here's the super badass thing, but we know very little about it other than where it came from and who has it now. Maybe there's more information that could be uncovered, and it helps these things feel more like magic items, even if it's just a plus one sword, right? It's like knowing that it was forged, you know, in, you know, the fire of burning bones, you know, in the massacre of, you know, the whatever. Well, and I, I think that, man, the whatever had it coming. Yeah. Um, I think that the thing is you got to ask as a player, like, what what do we do? Like, why, why are we here together, right? We're here to explore. Why do we explore? So that we can get treasure, but also so that we can protect ourselves from this shit world we live in, right? Mm-hmm. The more that I know about the goblins of the barren swamp, the better I can protect myself when they come looking for me or when we have to go through the barren swamp to get that treasure we heard about. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to engage the game in a way that allows me to risk in, in small ways to pay off later when I have to put it all in the line, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, so, starting to ha- I'm starting to have this really curious <laughs> idea about a game where players stay really weak from a combat perspective. But, shit, dude, yeah. I mean, but c- they characters... gain these, these one-ups that help them sort of like nuke their enemies. And that's like, uh, like okay, you're fighting a dragon, the reason you're killing it isn't because you have 60 hit points and it has 100 hit points and you deal, you know, you know, 23 damage per swing or anything like that. The reason you kill it is because it's missing a scale and you yeah. shoot it in its heart with the, you know, your your father's dwarven arrow. Exactly. And like you don't you don't get XP. This is the thing, right? So okay, Dungeons and Dragons does this thing where killing is the end, right? It's not the means, it's the end. Mm-hmm. You want to kill things because you get experience for killing them. So murder for its own sake, great, good call. Go go forth and slaughter, mm-hmm. right? But the way that we want to come at the game is exploration is the point, and combat is a way to get at that, right? Like, yeah, okay, you can learn that uh, silver kills werewolves by killing werewolves with a silver weapon, but that really is, shouldn't be about, the point shouldn't be about killing werewolves, it should be about protecting yourself from dying to werewolves. Yeah. And I think the thing is here is that, like, you're gonna, you're gonna dive in as a character, and a lot of the time PCs approach things from a very direct perspective, where they're like, I'm gonna go after this thing. But I think that they do that because the weapons they're given, uh, the, the tools, the implements that they're given by the game, encourage that where you can just... jump you can jump into combat because you're reasonably assured that the game was built in such a way that you are meant to fight mm-hmm. i was just I... gonna ask you like okay like it seems like our characters don't have a lot of mechanical things they can do in order to figure this stuff out like right now if i want to find out that goblins exist i have to walk out into the wilderness and find some goblins if i want to find out that they are human children stolen at birth i have to go talk to people until they tell me if i want to find out that they live exclusively in the barren swamps i have to venture in a whole bunch of different places until i only encounter goblins in the barren swamps like there's nothing i can do to there's nothing beyond narrative that I can do to find this information out as a player. Um, and this, the rare circumstances where there is a mechanic for finding out this information, it's super binary. It's like, well, I roll my arcana, and therefore I know the warlock's beloved is kept alive by necromancy. Yeah, totally. Uh, did you did you fail? Well, tough shit, man. Somebody else roll, or come back in a level and roll again. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think the thing is that the game the game is like um it's like a, a a bleak flower unfolding in that the closer the closer you get to the core of it, the more value you're gonna get. And and like we you, we only get the full picture of the setting when we have the opportunity to dig past those those outside layers, right? We're really engaging, using d d we're engaging in the combat layer of the game for its own sake. Mm-hmm. Whereas if I'm encouraged, this is this is the tension, right? So in d d it's like, can I kill this? If I think so, let's stay and fight it. If I don't think so, let's run, right? 
or let's wait till someone dies, then we'll run because then we're sure we can't kill it, right? That, those are my decisions. But the tension comes from how long can we be around these things before we need to run because we want to discover more stuff, right? This is mm -hmm. the, I sneak, I sneak into the goblin cave because I want to know what they eat because if I know what they eat, maybe I can poison it, mm -hmm. right? The tension there is, oh God, what if they find me and I'm not going to fall necessarily in, in, in D and D, my immediate fallback is, well, if they find me, fuck it, we can just kill them, yep. right? Like we can Looks try like to kill we're them. Fighting now. Yeah, we can we can roll initiative, we can use the thing, and and it's a it's a funnel in which everything ends up in combat, right? You can put a bunch of time and effort into other stuff, but ultimately the game is about kicking the living shit out of stuff or not getting the living shit kicked out of you. I'm going to um, uh, I'm going to bring up some very minor spoilers for yesterday's session of the West Marches chat. So if you haven't seen it. Mute yourselves until, well, it's, it's minor, 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 but if you really don't want any spoilers, mute yourselves Tiny until spoiler. I give this symbol. So, um, yesterday in the West Marches, uh, the team went back to the Ziggurat where the bandits and the, the um, where they had been sent by the, by the Serpent of Death. And um, they, they sort of wandered in again, yeah. They wandered in again and they didn't really, like, do anything clever to protect themselves. Uh, they just sort of wandered in, and then they got ambushed by another group of, you know, bandits. A smaller group, because there weren't as many left this time. But yeah. they just sort of like, you know, they blundered around making noise until everybody sort of rushed at them. But I also didn't feel like they had any tools to uh, avoid doing that. So actually, spoiler over, guys. I'll follow up with that last line, because it's not spoilery. But I also didn't feel like they had any tools to tackle that challenge in any other way. So they ended up just fighting a bunch. Um, yeah. And it worked out, and it worked fine, because Dungeons & Dragons is all about fighting, and that's great. But it would have been very interesting if they could have approached the circumstance from some other angle, mechanically, that would have allowed them to uh, experience that in a different way. Yeah. Well, and, and this is the thing. So let me. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna do my last. My last part of the moderate uh, modified experience, and then we'll talk about challenges and concerns. Mm -hmm. So, investment in the town. There's 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 two rewards here. There's you spend money, you buy a building, or you spend money and you activate an NPC. The reward is the NPC exists and you can use their services, right? Mm -hmm. But that's an altruistic reward. That's either I have to convince everybody else to get together and throw money in or I have to do what I did in that one episode and take 150 gold of my own money and just be like bam I want this it's done forget it but to incentivize that if you spend your own money or if you spend group money whatever every gold point gold piece spent on a town building or an NPC upgrade and there would have to be a list every piece of gold invested in the town gives you one experience point or whatever one measure of XP um, this is a way to make that altruistic to say, I spent 300 gold, I get 300 experience, this thing is activated, everyone can use it, way to go me, I'm a hero. Plus I get a little experience to keep me, you know, in line because I don't have that gold anymore, I can't go buy a magic item or buy potions. Yeah. So, oh, I mean, this, this one, this one's just jacked straight from D&D &D with a little bit of like a investment yeah. twist on yeah. it. Yeah, like d traditional D&D &D is every gold you earn in the wilderness gives you XP. Yeah, every gold you safely thing. get back to town, whatever yeah. you do with it. Um, I, I find it interesting. Um, it's not something that I had in mind originally, but I think it's it's definitely worth considering. Um, you wouldn't be able. You wouldn't necessarily be able to grind this XP because it's like you also need money for yeah. like you, you want like to be disease, able to buy disease stuff. cures yeah. and whatever. Um, now, you wouldn't necessarily have to reward. We could take this out and make it a different, like an economy reward. Yeah, where, I wonder if it's not XP you want to get from it, but something else. Yeah, kickbacks yeah. in gold or whatever. Mm -hmm. right? Like, I start a thieves' guild, the thieves do certain things, and I get kickbacks over time so that after, you know, 10 in-game weeks, I've made my money back mm -hmm. or whatever. Right? Or by, with some risk, like maybe the thieves' guild gets, like, shut down for a week. or So there's sub subsystems to engage with and... That's that's a thing. This that's how I would do it. This is just the easiest way I could think of. Yeah. Um, so, and this is why we wanted to wait uh, to talk about this. So challenges and concerns, and I think if you've been paying attention, you can see kind of where we're we're headed on this. Dungeons and Dragons and West Marches started here, right? They're best buds. Mm -hmm. But we're doing we're doing one of these, yep. right? Where D and D is like we're this kind of game. Here's some magic swords. You're level 10. That means you have lots of different ways to kill stuff and survive fighting. And we're like, 
maybe you don't have levels. Maybe you just have weird skills and you're trying to survive and you'll never get better at fighting anything. Yep. Or, or very marginally. Um, uh, I thought that your, your point about like D&D is like a flower and first we started on the outside petals. And then once we dove into XP and even to a certain extent background started exploring more stuff than inspiration did, which was kind of surprising to me. Once we dug deeper into the rose, we found out, oh my God, like the center of the West marches and the center of D&D are very different. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like the 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 core thing in, in West marches is this very like strange exploration of a weird place where you might never be able to rely on your martial skills to get you through, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it shouldn't matter in West Marches if I'm a first level paladin or a 20th level paladin. When I come across Baba Yaga, my first thought shouldn't be, well, fuck this, I'm 20th level, let's do it. It should be like, oh god, am I prepared to deal with this, right? And right now, the only way that you can make the game feel like that is by saying, like, okay, Baba Yaga's level 50, and she has yep. 7,000 yep. hit points. Like I, and the I, only way you can kill her is with a magic Baba Yaga killing sword. And you don't have that? Dead. You yep. are toast. Uh, minor spoiler for three episodes back of the West Marches. Uh, I know that Kurthak just wants to go out and murder the shit out of, um, out of Hextia. Yeah. And, like, in my mind, Hextia is basically Baba Yaga, right? But I'm not going to make her be, like, level 50, so... Yeah, Kurthak could just go murder her and do I and want how, that? And, like, how, how unsatisfying is that? Like, Kurthak spends all this time doing the, like, you know, martial arts training montage and then is like, cool, I'm level 5, let's get my level 5 homies and roll up in that chick's house and just punch her to death. Yep. That's yep. satisfying, right? It's way more satisfying to be like, well, here's the quest we have to go on and all the dangers that we have to avoid. And it's not about getting to a point where you can fight the thing equivalent. Like, you, you want to not fight it. You want to be like, guess what, Baba Yaga? You're a sucker because I found out your weakness. Yep, and, exactly. You know, here, here here's my bow strung with, uh, you know, silver made out of the hair of a unicorn and whatever. And it's like, you don't have to roll the hit. The fact that you have it, like, you never, you never read in a fairy tale, like, you know, they went off on this adventure, and they found the magic item they needed to kill the witch, and they came back, and he rolled a one, and the bow broke, and and then the witch killed everybody. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like, you have the thing, that's the point, right? It's like, the, the scene is literally like, you found the magic sword, or whatever, okay, you're at Baba Yaga's hut. Describe to me how you get your revenge on this horrible witch. Yeah. Not, let's roll initiative to see how it happens. And, and this isn't... Again, and I feel like it's necessary to talk about this. It isn't about talking shit about Dungeons and Dragons. Like D and D is awesome at being yeah. D and D, but we're not playing D and D anymore. Yep, pretty much. Um, I have a I have a question for you about this. Like, uh, obviously, I love D and I am still really enjoying Fifth Edition for what it is. Uh, but it seems clear now that uh. What we're trying to do with the West Marches is pretty seriously different from Dungeons and Dragons. Now, I have a question for you, Adam. Yes. If if there is a set of stuff that you're trying to discover about places, like you know, uh, vampires when you throw down rice grains, they stop and count them. Yeah. How do you get around players knowing that stuff but characters not? You make them discover it, right? Is the is the rice checkbox checked off on the vampire list? If no, the characters don't know that. Well, but and then you could have a player just say, "Oh, I I pack rice," and oh, I I just accidentally scatter. I mean, some. how do you how do you prevent me from reading the the cockatrice entry in the monster manual while we're fighting it, right? Like, yeah, you don't. Um, uh, also, just don't 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 use tropes. Like we we have our own world to to exist in. Like there's no nobody on earth that would guess like throwing a glass of human milk on a goblin would disintegrate yes. it. Like, yeah, just yeah, yeah. just make your monsters well, super weird. I'm thinking if if this were a separate game that came yeah. out with its own sort of like uh, monstrous you know compendium or whatever sure. uh, yeah, yeah. as a part of that game. Uh, yeah. And then it said, okay, you know, here are the, all of the things that you need in order to defeat a goblin. Here's what you learn about yeah, yeah. them. Like, sure. do we just tell GMs, like, you know, entries three, four, and five, fill out your own? Or are random, they all filled ran, out? Ran, or... Random tables, man. Just, mm, like, that's be true. like, monsters of this family. Like, you're making, don't, don't, even, don't even say, here's goblins. Say, if you want to make a goblinoid, here are 46 things you can roll on the table. Pick mm -hmm. three of them, right? Or, or how complicated do you want goblins to be? Pick one. 
right? Pick five, pick ten. Is your whole game about the the war against the Goblin King? Make it twenty. Yeah. Like, cluster them into groups, and have them mix and match, right? Be like, okay, goblins, cool. If you want to make really cool goblins, pick three off the roll three off the goblin list, and then pick two off the undead list and one off the demon list. Now yep. you have weird undead demon goblins. Yep. Right. And so, yeah, okay, maybe the player could literally memorize every possible thing that the goblins could have, but they never will, right? Yeah. All right. Awesome. Where are we and going one of the, with this? One of, the entries, one of the entries on that table could very easily just be a blank. Be like, fucking make something. Right, up, right, right one. Like, rubbing quartz on a goblin turns them good. It cures them and they go back to being humans. Cube, and like, cures them of goblinhood. Yeah. Cures yeah. their goblinitis and they're fine. Yeah. So. I mean, I guess the thing here is that we're playing a game that's very specifically focused on one hammer nail situation, right? You know, like, combat is the primary challenge. Overcoming combat is uh, achieved by gaining experience, by surviving combat. And you continue to roll through that economy. And that's and that's fine, right? The, the, whole, the game is fun if that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. Exploring places that might have bad things to fight fighting them for experience and getting treasure and then continuing to, to do that. Um, but like, I feel like knowing this, you know, we, we, we have a lot, we have a lot more work ahead of us because either, I mean, there's two things, right? Cause you want to keep playing the West marches. So mm -hmm. we need to continue bending dungeons and dragons on, on the one path to a place where it still feels like D and D and does some of the West marches stuff. But while we're doing that, we, we need to make a new game that's, you know, West March yep. was the role-playing game that does all of this stuff exactly the way we want it to. Yep, that's that's what we've got to do. Um, I think, like, there are some obvious things, like, at the exterior parts of the petal of the rose that we can that we can change out. So backgrounds, I'm going to continue working through those and, and changing up the ones that are available and the flavors that they have and um, and the features that you get. Inspiration, I'm already really happy with the way that's working out. Uh, if we end up with some kind of uh, strange investigatory sort of like component list, then uh, we're gonna we're gonna put that into the West Marches as the show. But yeah, uh, Adam. I mean, I feel I f yeah, I feel like we're kind of unofficially like do you semi wanna, announcing that we're. I mean, we're do you want to make a new game? Yeah, I do. I want. Awesome. I would like to make a West Marches role playing game. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, it's going to take a lot of work, and yep. it will take some time, but I think it's possible. Like, I think we've done a lot of work understanding. We're doing the hard stuff now in analyzing the experience of a game that maybe we aren't fully happy with. <sighs> I mean, yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to end up having to make a game that fits what we want to make, and it's going to be... There's a, I've, I've done this before. It's not an easy thing, but yeah. I think we've already done... We've set a lot of the, the foundation here. So, like... How long from this stage to putting Dungeon World on the shelf did it take you? Just well, so that, everybody in chat yeah, is aware. For sure. So, I mean, the thing with Dungeon World was that, and this, I mean, this is exactly the way the Dungeon World got started, too, in that we were like, okay, cool. So we're going to sit down and make a game that feels more like the D&D we want to play. And we worked on it uh, slowly over time and built, a, like, an Ashcan version and whatever, and... I mean, it took us on and off like two years to get from let's make a game to, but there's no like hard point where we're like, we're doing it. The yeah. actual writing of the game, um, I mean, it, it depends, right? Like playtesting is a thing and maybe that's something that we can talk about the next time that we get together to stream is like, okay, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. You know, like what do we need to do to make these notes about fifth edition into uh, uh, an outline for a brand new uh, role playing game that does some similar stuff to D&D but fits the west marches make does this hex crawl thing this ex exploration thing in a in a real good way yep i think i think the right like way to go from here is um is like to really define the creative direction of what the west marches is yeah uh, sort of get you know documents and uh, like Pinterest board and all sorts of stuff that fills our heads mutually with what we want to see. We're obviously like, I think we're very close to the same page. I'm liking some stuff you're putting out. I'm like, you're liking yeah. some stuff I'm putting out. Um, and then next time we would sit down with all that stuff and say, okay, here's the direction we want to go. 
how can we break it down into uh, achievable tasks? Yeah, and I think that we've got a good um, we've got a good structure here in that I think that you have a good idea of the creative direction of what this game is going to be, and um, I'm I'm more invested in the the like moment to moment table stuff, yep. and we can kind of go back and forth on that. Like I'm I don't think there's ever going to be a point where I'm going to say to you like this doesn't feel like the right thing. My question, my point's going to be more like, how can we make this feel like the right thing? And like, mm -hmm. where where are we going with this particular thing? Yeah. Um, so that's a thing, I guess. And we have the advantage of being able to uh, engage with this stuff on a, um, like a pretty significant level with like an audience and like have people give us feedback. And I, I think it's really interesting. I think it's going to be cool to see uh, the, the process. And even if even if the game ends up just being a dead end and we don't end up releasing it, I think it's very cool to be able to do all this out in the open, to say like, okay, oh, yeah. we, we're going to email back and forth all the time about this stuff, but we're going to have like regular meetings where we just talk about what, um, yeah, what kind of, uh, what kind of stuff that we want to do with the game. Yep, uh, definitely. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm super excited because the idea of making a game that does more West Marchy stuff is yeah. really exciting to me. Like, you know, D&D does great stuff, and when you're reading uh, Fawford and the Grey Mouser, when you're reading um, The Dying Earth, when you're reading Conan, like, those are the kinds of stories you get out of Dungeons & Dragons really easily and really naturally. But when you're yeah. reading Russian fairy tales, when you're reading Hans Christian Andersen, when you're reading Beowulf, that stuff doesn't happen in Dungeons & Dragons. I'd love to see a game that makes that stuff happen. So yeah. that's all really exciting. Uh, I think so too. Where do we go from here, Adam? I mean, I feel like I feel like this is probably it's a little a little early, but I feel like this is probably a good place to end the episode because the work is going to be between now and the next one. <laughs> yep. So, uh, what we should do between now and the next episode is just fill our brains with the West Marches and what it means, and then from the next episode forwards, we're going to break it down into how to accomplish that and what kind of systems we need to develop. Is that it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that we need to, now that we've acknowledged the fact that there's a lot more to break down, um, we can we can take a step back. Like, I would I would put all this stuff kind of on the shelf for now. Like, keep playtesting some of the things that you want to use in West Marches, um, but we, we need to take a step back and say, okay, what what is it, what makes up a character? What do characters need to be good at? How do we want them to be good at them differently? Um, do we want to keep it as a class system? Do we want to talk about, like, just professions? Like, there's, there's lots more structure that we could, and we also have the freedom now to say being structurally bound to anything to do with D&D isn't a problem that we have anymore. We can, we can excise that from, yep. from requirements. Um, and, and also I think that there's a lot of talking to be done about, um, I mean, if we're making, are we making a game just for us? Are we making a game that anyone could pick up and play? How much of the game do we want to consider uh, as having the audience involved? Because, I mean, we're making a thing that has never needed to exist before, right? We're making a game that has thousands of people watching people play it, and we want yep. to be able, theoretically, to replicate that, right? Yeah. So, well, uh, one thing that I'm just really excited about it for the for people who have the possibility. This is like putting the cart before the horse. When I was playing Dungeons and Dragons regularly in my real life, you know, setting of real people coming to my house and playing it. Um, one of the hardest challenges that I couldn't ever really solve was attendance over the course of time. And also, yeah. like, whether or not, uh, like, I had a set of people that I was playing with and then other people might want to play in. And, like, do I want to just play with these four people every week? Or would it be nice to every once in a while swap in, like, you know, this new coworker, or, you know, someone's girlfriend comes over or boyfriend comes over uh, and plays for one session. Like, the West yeah. Marches lets you do some things that, for me right now, um... Tabletop role-playing games don't do very well. Yeah, they don't, they don't handle that kind of social aspect of role-playing. Well, well, and this this is the thing, right? Like, I mean, I I don't want to say it's been like an agenda from the beginning, but it's a thing that I've had in my head that like you can get a certain distance by modifying a game to do the thing that you want, but eventually you get to a place where um, Dungeons and Dragons just won't be sufficient in that regard and you just got to make your own make your own game and like you know we we talked earlier about 
it's funny because the things that were easy before, like how does D&D help us? What advantages do we have? Those are now, what are we losing when we make a new game, right? Mm -hmm. Those things go away. So, I mean, I think it's obvious watching the stuff that we've been working on so far that you can see that there are less, D&D is doing us way less favors than it needs to. Well, we and identified if, that in the first session. Yeah, and if, if we're doing, if we're making a game whose explicit purpose is take people who might not know anything about D&D but are familiar with the tropes and bend them in such a way that we can uh, make a game that's still as easy to access. Like, honestly, I think that um, the, the D&D stuff about the game, people don't really know that coming to it. Like, Zeke and Co. and those dudes, like, I don't know that they have a bunch of 5e experience where they're coming to the table and are like, cool, I'm going to be a cleric because I know clerics get this AC and these attack bonuses. They're like, this description sounds cool. The choices I get to make sound kind of neat. I'm going to play that. But they still have the backup stuff. They have the, like, I know what a cleric is. And so we're still drawing on that same cultural pool, but we can we can bend it so much more easily now. Like, the palette that we have is not restricted to the, you know, red, green, and blue of Dungeons & Dragons. Now we can paint in crimson and, and ochre, and, like, we've got all these, like, darker, weirder colors we can use. Yeah. Because we're not just putting a fresh coat of paint on D&D, we're making a whole new painting. Yeah, definitely. Um, awesome. So, I guess that's it. Uh, yeah. And Adam and I are going to try to maybe make a new game. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's yeah. a thing. Exciting. Uh, I think so, too. I will put a Q&A up on JP's subreddit. Yeah. I mean, we're still making West, it's West Marches the game, so... Yeah. That's, so, that's the place I think people are going to want to... Can, you can head over to reddit.com slash r slash hitmejp, and we'll, we'll both be around every once in a while to answer any questions you might have about this episode. Um, and then, you know, Adam and I will talk offline about when we want to have the next episode, and by the time we come back for another show of Hack Attack, uh, we may need to ask Leafington to make that say different things now. <laughs> Yeah, but we'll yeah. we'll we'll start still, digging more tinkering. into. Yeah, we're yeah. still tinkering. We're just we're we're just hacking the concept. We're not hacking D and D anymore. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> True. All cool. right. I guess that's it. Should, so, we, should um, we should we outro? Yeah, Adam. Who are you and what do you do? I am Adam Koval. I'm uh, Roll Twenties resident GM and uh, part time video game streamer here at uh, twitch.tv slash Adam Koval. I am a game designer. I co wrote Dungeon World and have several other role playing games uh, in, in the works right now. And I've just added one to that list because I needed more work in my life. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, which you should, uh, my Twitter is at skinnyghost. And uh, that's where I do all of my sort of short form spitballing and update my schedule and all that action. So if you're interested in more of what I'm doing, uh, drop a follow here in the channel uh, or and or follow me on Twitter uh, at Skinny Ghost. And I'm Stephen Lumpkin. I'm the lead level designer for a game called Warhammer 40,000 Eternal Crusade. So that's going to be fun. It's a third person shooter, uh, massive shooter MMO-ish kind of game. Um, and uh, you can follow me on at Silent Osiris. You can see it right here. The O is zero. Yeah, um, you should give me a follow on Twitch as well. Same, it's twitch.tv slash Silent Osiris. And go ahead on over to um, reddit.com slash r slash itmejp uh, and ask us questions about uh, this episode of Hack Attack and the game that we may be trying to piece together. Cool. Uh, one, one more quick thing. If you haven't checked it out already, there's only three days left on the Blades in the Dark Kickstarter. Uh, it's a really awesome game about playing uh, a gang of thieves in a sort of fantasy industrial uh, land, but it's also got an ass ton of extra material, some of which I'm writing. Uh, I'm creating a, a new setting for it called Womb of Night, where you play the crew of a weird 70s psychedelic hard rock inspired heavy metal spaceship. Uh, I think it's going to be really cool, really fun. The game is fantastic. Three days left as the, the time of this. Uh, go check it out. Blades in the Dark on Kickstarter. It's a super good role-playing game. You will not regret it. Awesome. That's I it for tonight, for guys. So have a wonderful day, and we will see you next time.